So how many of ever, um, you ever wanted something, like you, you, know, you, you wanted something, and then when it came, you kind of went, you regretted it. Like, like you wanted something really bad, and, and then when you got it, you went, you know what, that, that was really way better in the commercial, or like the, it just wasn't, it didn't live up to what you expected it to be, or it just, it didn't, or, or maybe when you, you wanted something, and then something else a little bit different come along, and, you're went, and you kind of went, oh, thank God I got the different, and not what I actually wanted, because if I got what I actually want, now I can see because of the different, that this makes a huge difference, like that either God really saved me from something, or, or something Something just, you know, went better or went well, uh, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, anybody been in that situation? Yeah. And so th there's a story uh, about the disciples in their communication and in their kind of expectations of Jesus uh, that, that it ends up exactly like that, that we're going to get into in just a couple minutes. We're going to see in Acts chapter 1 and 2, et cetera. We're going to a ton of scripture. So, But my name is Nathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridgeline. Super excited to be with you today as we conclude this series that we've been in called the Holy Spirit and just so grateful for all of that. And I got to let you know about one thing that I'm pumped about. We got our Christmas Eve Eve service uh, coming up Sunday the 23rd at 5 p.m. So there will not be a Sunday morning service. Really pumped about that. There will not be a Sunday morning service and there won't be a Christmas Eve service. We're combining them into one and doing it on that Sunday evening. So really, really pumped about uh, everything that's happening there. Now, if you remember, this is week three of the series that we've been in called the Holy Spirit. In week one, we, we talked about in the beginning, we looked at, the, um, we looked at the, the person of the Holy Spirit as he is active in creation. We looked at Genesis chapter one. Uh, we talked about the Spirit of God hovering over or brooding, I love that word, brooding over the face of the deep, and, and that the, ultimately the Spirit of God is hovering over our own lives, wanting to bring to our remembrance the testimony of Jesus. Such a great time, uh, and that was such a fun message. In week two, last week, we looked at what would Jesus do, and we, uh, we looked at the life of Jesus, and, and we said ultimately that Jesus is our example of what it means to live as a man without sin, and empowered by Holy Spirit. Of course, as a man, we know that Jesus wasn't just a man, but when he came to earth, he laid all of his godly attributes aside. Uh, of course, we can't live without sin, but, but through the gift of righteousness, because of Jesus on the cross, G, uh, uh, we have the gift of righteousness, and, so, and, and then we can also be reliant and empowered by Holy Spirit. And just such a, a, a good, uh, fun Fun message and a, and a good week, and I hope you learned a lot. If you missed any of it, make sure you get caught up online, ridgelineashville.com, and you can watch, um, you know, the last couple of weeks. Or any of our messages, really. But today, I want to talk to you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is in a lot of denominations or a lot, a lot of different places. It's very controversial or, or how, it, how it plays out, what it might look like today or whatever. And in a lot of ways, I'm not going to get into what it looks like for today. But, but in just even the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit can be uh, very controversial in a lot of denominations. And so I want to make sure to take the time to lay some, uh, some foundational understanding for what exactly it means to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And so it is, and at the end of the service today, we're going to pray, and we're going to ask the Lord to come and baptize us. And for those of us that haven't been baptized and want to be baptized, I believe that God is going to baptize you with this Holy Spirit today. And I'm really excited for that. So there's this great story about the disciples, where, where they, they think they want something, they think they know what they want. They keep bugging and pestering Jesus about it. They keep asking him for it. They keep, okay, is this when it's going to happen? Is this when it's going to happen? Is this when it's going to happen? And it doesn't exactly play out the way that they want it to play out. It doesn't exactly happen the way that they want it to happen. And then it turns out to be way better and way more than they ever anticipated or ever expected. In fact, way more than they really ever wanted or that they knew that they wanted. Of course, we know we look at the life of Jesus. Jesus is born. He, he grows up. He becomes a rabbi, all, all the different things. And he begins to teach uh, about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And he begins to say some words and speak some language that begins to trigger some things in the heart of all the young Jewish men. He begins to talk about the, the kingdom of God. 
And so they know that there are prophecies that talk about that the Messiah is coming and he'll, there'll be a kingdom. And of course, at this point in, Israel, in history, Israel is under the rule of, of the Roman Empire. And it's this weird tension and it, they're not really free. And, and it's, a, it's an awkward time in history and it's a real challenge. And they just want to be their own nation. And they just want a king to come along and, and to overthrow the Roman government so they, that way they can be a nation again. And so Jesus comes on the scene, and all the signs, and a lot of, for, for most people, for a lot of people, not for most, but for a lot, point to Jesus being the Messiah. And so they think that Jesus is going to set up an earthly kingdom, an earthly kingdom where, where then Jesus will make Jesus king, they'll overthrow the Roman Empire, and everything will be great again. So Jesus begins to teach about kingdom. We've looked at lots of parables, lots of stories from Jesus where, where it starts with, you know, the kingdom of God is like or the kingdom of heaven is like. And he begins to talk about these concepts or begins to talk about these things. What is everybody pointing at? Really? Oh, that's so good. Is it a dove? Because that would be cool. It's a blue jay. Uh-oh. I'm in trouble. <laughs> that was a story from last week. If you didn't get this, you need to watch the message. All right. There's a bird. That could be cool. All right. Thank you, Holy Spirit. All right. So Jesus is teaching kingdom. And so the disciples on a couple of occasions call, okay, is God, Jesus is now the time when, when, when you're going to overthrow the king. Is now the time when you're going to, like, is now the time they begin to ask him. And, of course, Jesus either ignores them or tries to explain kingdom better or whatever. And then here's what happens. If I get everybody to look here, that would be great. So then here's what happens. They think they're at about the pinnacle of this movement where it's finally going to be time. Jesus gets arrested and then is executed. He gets arrested and he's put to death. So then that's it, right? That's the end of the story. There's no kingdom. There's no king. It's all over. And in fact, the disciples are so convinced that it's all over that they go and hide because they are scared for their lives. And they're convinced that if they came after Jesus and we were like his closest boys, then they're going to come after us too. Because if they're just going to weed out the problem, they're going to just weed out the whole problem. And then in Acts chapter 2, around 50 days later, the disciples, who were previously terrified for their lives, are out in public on the day of Pentecost, uh, the, the, the feast, uh, the Jewish feast. Uh, they're out in public and they're teaching and preaching about Jesus. Now, now they're not, they're, the Jesus who died, it's like, yeah, that same Jesus. Now, they're not, here's what they're not teaching or preaching. They're not teaching that, hey, there was this guy, Jesus, and he was a good man. Or, hey, there was this guy, Jesus, and he said some pretty cool or great or encouraging or uplifting stuff. That's not what they're teaching. They're, they're not. What they're actually teaching is that there's this guy, Jesus, and he was exactly who he said he was. In fact, he, he died on the cross, he rose again, and we've seen him. We've seen him with our own eyes. And we don't care what it costs us to tell you this message or to preach this story. We don't care. We'll, we are willing to die to let you know that we've seen him alive again. This is our firsthand account. This is our personal testimony that we've seen Jesus. And they're no longer afraid because two things had happened. One, Jesus had risen from the dead. And two, they'd become empowered by the Holy Spirit. They were baptized by the Holy Spirit. 
And it was not like the power that they wanted or, or the power that they expected. It wasn't political power. It wasn't just kind of a, you know, like, hey, we're going to be like in a top cabinet somewhere. We're going to make get to make laws or enforce rules or, or we're going to. It was a completely different type of power than what they'd been expected. It, it was it was the it was a greater power even than what they'd expected. It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so before we get into the baptism of the Holy Spirit specifically, I want to look at the three main types of baptism in Scripture. There are three, what I would call, three main types. I I know there's more than that, and this fourth one I'm in personal pursuit of, and there's a fourth one that I'm in personal pursuit of and and so excited about and been praying for for a while. But there, there are three main baptisms. And so I want to talk to you about all three. And so here, here's the three main, of course, like I said, there's more in scripture. We see baptism in different kind of ways and, and whatever. Now, here's something important to, to understand. When the, whenever you see the word baptism in scripture, uh, understand that in, in, especially in the New Testament, that it was translated from a common word that was used every day for a lot of things. Now, we only use baptism to describe when, when you know, somebody goes under the water and comes back up, right? But, like, if you were, uh, it comes from the Greek word baptizo, and, and if you were pickling uh, cucumbers, you would baptizo the cucumber into the vinegar, okay? And it would sit there, and it would be baptizoing. I don't know what the, what the right tense is, but it, it was a common word, Okay? And also, it, the common word could also, for English, just to help you with a word picture, or whatever to understand, could mean immerse, like fully immersed. Okay? It, it's not uh, uh, just like a sprinkling, like, like some of us may have grew up in, in that type of church culture or whatever. It's, it's not, it is a full and complete immersion. Okay? So the first type of baptism is this. Baptism, or baptized into the body of Christ. This would be salvation. Now, not just, now understand, the baptized or completely immersed into the body of Christ. This is not just knowing about God. This is not just going to church once in a while. This is when you decide to make Jesus Christ the absolute Lord and final say of your life. When you are baptized into the family of God. And that, 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 what, what, that making a decision to follow Christ absolutely consumes who you are. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul writes it like this. For we were all baptized by one spirit uh, as to form one body. Whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, we were all given, to the, one, we were all given the one spirit to drink. He also says, Paul also says it like this in Galatians chapter 3. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith for all of you uh, who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So the first baptism that we see is the baptism into the body of Christ. Now the second baptism that we see is baptism by water, right? Right? Now, most of us that are here today have probably been, you know, would say that I've, I would consider myself to be a Christian or a Christ follower, whatever. We've been baptized in, into um, the body of Christ. Probably a good portion of us here today have been water baptized. Now, what you have to understand is that water baptism and, and baptism into the body of Christ, two completely separate events. And this is important, okay? Because baptism into the body of Christ... There's nothing we can do to earn that or deserve it. There's no works that we do. We receive grace from God. It's, there's nothing that we, Paul even writes, that, that it's not by works of righteousness, so we can't even boast about, hey, look how good I am. I've been baptized into the body of Christ. We can't do that. Salvation is all about God's grace. It has nothing to do with our earning it, our merit, how deserving we are of it, or whatever. Now, water baptism is a step that we take to signify what's happened to us on the inside. Now, here's the problem with water baptism. I think over the years, uh, the, the kind of the theology of water baptism, whatever, there's probably a term for that, whatever that would be, has become pretty corrupt or, or diluted. And, and, and sometimes we baptize infants before they're even able to, to, to 
to be baptized into the body of Christ and make that decision for themselves. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we, there's churches that argue about, you know, when you're baptized, you have to say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's other churches who would tell you, no, you have to say in the name of Jesus. So we've solved that problem. When you get baptized here at Ridgeline, we say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. Okay, just, to, just taking care of all of our bases here. But it's not like when you get to heaven, God's going to say, listen, I can't let you in. Because when you were baptized, they didn't say the right thing. That's not going to happen. Okay? Because you're already eternally taken care of. You're baptized into the body of Christ. Now, Jesus commands us to be baptized. It's important for us to be baptized into water. It, it's something, I had a, a kid in my youth group when I, years ago when I was a youth pastor. He said, you know, God never, like, I, I know that I'm a Christian, but I just feel like God's never told me that I should be water baptized. And I'm thinking, have you read the Bible? Like, Jesus tells you, like, so many times. <laughs> like, scripture tells us so many times. You don't have to hear an audible voice from heaven about being baptized. The Bible tells you to be baptized, be water baptized. Water baptism is a lot like wearing a wedding ring. It's an outside symbol of what's happening on the inside. Just because I wear a wedding ring doesn't make me married. Just because I'm married doesn't mean I have to wear a wedding ring. But it's a symbol of something that, that should have gone on on the inside. Okay? So here's what, here's what Jesus says, Matthew chapter 10, about water baptism, or just in general, but I think this applies to water baptism. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Baptism is an outward, uh, an outward expression of, of something that's happened down on the inside of us. And so in essence, we're, we're acknowledging God before people. I will also acknowledge you before my Father in heaven, but whoever uh, disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Now this, understand that's not specifically talking about water baptism, but hear the point. Number three, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Third baptism. Not because you don't have the Holy Spirit, in fact, the scripture says that you can't come to the Father without salvation, or uh, you can't come into salvation without the leading of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives to, to, to draw us to the Father. There's a whole bunch of that type of thing, but, but it's not because we don't have the Holy Spirit, but here's the difference. There's a difference between holding a glass of water and jumping into a swimming pool, right? There's a difference between drinking a glass of water and having that water inside of you and jumping into a swimming pool and being completely immersed in the pool. So Acts chapter 8. Here's where we see an example of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all three, actually. So Philip went down to a city uh, in Samaria and proclaimed the message there but when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So here's what happens. So Philip goes down to Samaria, and, and revival breaks out. People are getting saved left and right. And so then Philip begins to water baptize them. Okay, So this is verse 5 and verse 12 that's explaining this to us. Let's jump to verse 14 because there's lots of footnotes kind of in the story. And, and here's how it continues. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria, Sam, Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. Okay, so, so two of the apostles get sent down to follow up on what Philip, you know, they were like, man, God's doing something great in Samaria. Let's send a couple of our leadership down and let's really, let's really see what's going on. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on them. Now understand it was in them, but it had not yet come on them and any of, not yet come on any of them. And they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So in this story, we see all three baptisms. We see that, that in Samaria, they were baptized into the body of Christ. They were baptized by water and then they become baptized by the Holy Spirit. 
Three separate baptisms. And I think that that's important to understand that, that, that salvation, the baptism into the body of Christ is, is all that we need to get to heaven, okay? We, we don't have to be water baptized to get to heaven. You don't have to be filled with the Holy Spirit to get to heaven. And there's nothing that we can do to earn or deserve salvation. It is a gift. Now, a lot of times in charismatic or Pentecostal churches or, 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 or theologies, there, there, is this, there is this term for the baptism of the Holy Spirit called a second work of grace. And I, I like the way that that distinguishes it from salvation. Salvation being our first work of grace. But then it, it's, it's a second work of grace. It's a second thing that happens. And it doesn't mean it can't happen at the same time or that there's a timetable. As far as, you know, like you get your first work of grace and then you go to a class and then you wait six months and then God can give you a second work of grace. It's not like that. Look, I believe that God didn't want us to mix up grace with any of our works or anything that we could do. Okay? That's why there's three separate baptisms or, or you know, a, a, a second work of grace. This third baptism in the Holy Spirit does not have I don't know how to say this right. So hear, hear me as I say it and, and kind of flesh out this idea in front of you. <laughs> let, me, let me back up and say this. I think that everything has eternal purpose. Everything that we do in life has eternal value, okay? So then here's the statement that I don't like, but I don't know how else to say. The baptism of the Holy Spirit does not have any eternal purpose or value. Okay, here's what I mean. The empowerment of God the Holy Spirit coming on our lives is for us here and now. It is for us in this life. It is for us to, to fulfill the, the call of God on our life here and now. Once we enter into eternity, I don't think that, that there'll be a lot of need for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll be completely entrenched in the glory of God, right? Right? And so it's not that the baptism, like as we pray in the Holy Spirit or begin, those things, of course, our prayers have eternal value. Or, you know, praying in the Holy Spirit being, you know, what we do on earth has eternal value. So I'm not, I'm not saying it as cut and dry as it comes out. But, but, but in essence, what I, what I am trying to communicate is that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is to our, empower our lives here on earth. Here and now. It has nothing to do with, you know, someday when we get to heaven. No. Salvation takes care of getting to heaven. The baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do what God has called us to do here and now. First John chapter uh, 5. We see all three parts of the Godhead. John writes about this. I love the way John writes about the Holy Spirit specifically. But we see... All three parts of the Godhead and all three kind of baptisms, all in two verses from John. This is what he writes. He said, for there are three that bear witness in heaven. I like that. There are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word. Of course, John always referred, not always, but John often referred to Jesus as the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? That's how John, the first book of John, the Gospel of John starts. This is 1 John, so a different book. But, but uh, all three uh, that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, which would be Jesus or the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And John continues to write, and here's what he says. He says, and there are three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit, capital S, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. So we see the blood, salvation, Jesus. We see the water, water baptism. We see the Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I believe... This is the scriptural journey that God intends for us as believers to take. That God has for us in relationship with him. 
That we wouldn't just stop at the blood. We wouldn't just stop at, well, I got saved, I gave my life to Jesus, but it, it doesn't really have to alter the way that I live. Uh, it doesn't really have to change anything on the inside of me. I'm not really going to tell many people about it. I'm not really, but no, that we would take the next step and be water baptized. And, and we would make a public declaration that, look, this is what's gone on on the inside of me. And now I'm going to let people know. And, and then we wouldn't just stop there and not that it has to be in this order, but, but that we'd also come to a place where we would say, God, I know that you have plans and purposes for my life and I know that you want to give me power and empower me to be able to live this out and do it. So, all that was the intro. I expected to get a laugh. What I got were terrified faces like, well, we're going to be here a while. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So here's the question. How do the disciples get from hiding, terrified for their lives, how do they get from there to boldly preaching and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, not concerned at all for their own well-being? And not just preaching, preaching to thousands. In fact, I don't know how many uh, tens of thousands could have possibly been there. It says that 3,000 got saved that day. Can you imagine how big the crowd would have had to been for 3,000 to be saved? So here's the journey. I love this. Acts chapter 1. After his suffering... He, pre he presented himself, this is Jesus, after Jesus' suffering, he presented himself to them, them being the disciples, and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He approached, uh, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, well, where, where am I at? On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Now, I love, this, this story is in the end of Luke, and it's, it's one other place in Scripture. And I love the, the first time he appears to them, because they're all, it says, I think it's Luke who talks about that, they're all locked in a room. Like, literally, the door is locked, and that Jesus walks through a wall, or appears, appears to them in the middle of the room, and then, of course, he's like, peace be still, or peace be with you. Go now, if, if a dude walks into a room when the doors are locked and I'm going to need a little more than, hey, peace be with you, I'm going to want to fight because I don't know how you got in this room and I'm terrified for my life right now, okay? But Jesus, and then he says it a second time, which really, I don't know why he dials it up. So, anyway, so he, said, so, so he appears to them. It's like some weird stuff's going on here. But, but while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, now, wait a minute, Jesus. Jerusalem's where they want to kill us. Jerusalem's where we have to fear for our lives. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which I have heard, which you have heard me speak about. Continues in verse 5. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you... Are you, at this time, going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They're still about this power thing. They're still asking the same question. Okay, so you died. We thought this whole kingdom business was going to be over. We thought, how are we going to ever overthrow Rome? Now, Jesus is back because you can't hold him down. And so then, so then he, you know, okay, Jesus, you're back. So we going to do this thing? We taking on Rome or what? Are we taking on Rome? He continues... He said to them, it's none of your business, basically. It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power. Yeah, well, that, that's what we keep asking about, Jesus. That's what we keep talking about. When are we going to get this power? Uh, you will receive power when? When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be filled you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now listen, what did we talk about in week two? 
That when the Holy Spirit, it, it comes on us, why? To help us with the remembrance of the testimony of Jesus. And, and this is exactly what Jesus is saying. And you will be my witness. In other words, you will be a witness. You will be a firsthand storyteller of what you saw, what you experienced. And nobody can take that from you. It doesn't matter how logical or illogical it sounds. You saw it with your own eyes firsthand. And then he says this awesome part. You'll be my witness where? In Jerusalem. They're like, yeah, finally. Jerusalem, we're taking it back. And he says, in all of Judea, wait a minute, Judea? And Samarit Samaria? Now, remember the parable of the, the Good Samaritan? Remember that one? Where the guy, uh, the guy dead on the side, or, you know, dying, he gets beat up and robbed on the side of the road, and a religious person passes him, and some, somebody else passes him, and then, then a Samaritan goes, and instead of just walking by, he goes and helps him. So the concept of a good Samaritan would have been a, a foreign, foreign concept to, to the Jewish people because Samaritans were half-breeds. They didn't like the Samaritans. It was a racial thing. Probably not unlike what we see in today's culture from time to time, you know. It was a racial thing. They didn't like him. There was no such thing as a good Samaritan as far as the Jewish people were concerned. Samaria? And then to the ends of the earth? Here's what happened. Had they had just gotten political power, probably none of us would know who the disciples are. Had they had just gotten what they wanted, probably none of us would know who they are. But the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon them gave them stories so big that it carried their names and reputations throughout history. So here's what happens. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it starts like this. It says, on, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. And here's where two, because they were praying. They were listening to Jesus. They stayed together, said, don't leave Jerusalem. Pray, wait for the Holy Spirit. So they've been doing that for about 40 days. There was about 120 of them here at this time. Suddenly a sound. No, it wasn't. They weren't waiting 40 days. I can't remember. Uh, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, can you imagine this? You're in prayer Tuesday night at my place like we often do. If you miss it, you're missing out. Imagine, we're just praying. You know, we're praying for Kim's salvation or we're praying for, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> Bessie to find a man. I don't know what we're praying for. Just, <laughs> just say it, just say it. Random things we pray for. We're praying. And all of a sudden, there's a sound like a hurricane in the house. And then you look, you look out, you look around, and you go, there's no wind. You, you open up the balcony door and you go, there's no wind out here. It's as still as can be. But it, when you walk back in the house, you go, what is going on? It was a sound that came from heaven that filled the whole house where they were sitting. A blowing, a violent blowing. And then... On top of the sound, now it says they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rested on each of their heads and rested on each of them. So it sounds like a hurricane and it looks like your head's on fire. That's what's happening. That's what it seems like is happening. Now, in reality, their heads weren't actually on fire and there wasn't a hurricane in the room. That's not the reality of what was happening. That's what it seemed like, and that's pretty intense, and that's pretty amazing. And so it separated and came to rest on them. And then all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So what's interesting to me about this is it seemed like there was a blowing, and it seemed like there were fire, but they all were filled. So the reality was that, the, that the, the wind wasn't real and the fire wasn't real, but they really were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the ability. And it's right after this 
that they step out from this prayer meeting and they begin to tell the testimony of Jesus. And Peter, who couldn't even tell a teenage girl that he was a follower of Jesus just a little bit earlier, preaches and 3,000 Three thousand get saved. So what happens? What happened in between? What happened in between the death of Jesus and Peter preaching and the apostles preaching? They saw the resurrected Savior, and they were given power. They were empowered by God, the Holy Spirit. They were immersed by the presence of the third person of the Trinity. So how do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? I want to share with you three things. How do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? Number one, I, I, I would say we have to remove all barriers. Remove all barriers. For some of us here this morning, we, there's a ton of barriers. One I, I want to address real quick, and then one we'll address with Scripture in just a second. For some of you here this morning, there's a theological barrier to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you grew up in a theology or in a church that didn't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that didn't believe in, in uh, you know, um, that, that maybe had a, what we would call a sensationalist theology that said that, that the working of the Holy Spirit or, or, you know, healings and miracles, signs and wonders, all of that ended with the apostles. It is not for today. Of course, I would say to that that we know from multiple scriptures that says that, you know, in the end times, I think Joel talks about, I think in the end times, God's going to pour out his spirit on all men. There's talk about prophecies and dreams and, and visions and whatever. Of course, uh, there are other prophecies to talk about that the pour, outpouring of the spirit is, is not just for us or for our children, but for our children's children's children. And it goes on for generations, which would obviously outlast the life of the, the apostles. Remove all barriers. For some of us, there's a theological barrier that would say that this isn't for today or that this isn't for me. And so here's what I want to challenge you today. I can't, obviously, you know, I'm not going to try to reprogram your theology uh, other than teaching the way that I've taught this morning. But ask, ask the Holy Spirit to say, and just say, I believe that you're bigger than any theological barrier that I could have and I give you full permission in my life. Here, Acts 2 says this. It says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And so we would just want to say for a minute this morning, God, I confess any sin in my life. If you can think of any, you know, Josh, we don't have all day. God, I repent. Forgive me. I turn from my sin. And God, I ask if there's any theological barriers in my life, I give you permission to bust through those this morning. Jesus name. Number two, request the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Request. And say it like this. Here's, here's how I would say it. God, whatever you have for me today, I, I want to receive it, whatever it is. I, I don't know how I feel about it or believe in it or, you know, whatever, but uh, you know what? It, 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 it busts through the barriers of my heart the barriers of my beliefs, the barriers of my theology, the barriers of, of my upbringing, because I want to receive all that you have for me today. And here's what I would say is don't filter whatever God wants to do in your life today through what the lens of what you think is normal. Because heaven and earth don't look the same. How heaven defines normal, what we would say is normal on earth, man, those things are way different. 
Not only that, I would ask you probably, how's normal been working out for you, right? Luke 11 says this, if then, though you who are evil know how to give, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He said, look, you guys, Jesus, this is Jesus talking to the disciples, and I love how he says, look, you bunch of ragtag evildoers, guys, like you sinners, you know how to treat your kids good? Isn't God better than y'all? Isn't he able to, to give some, like, like if you can give good gifts, think about how good God's gifts can be. Think about it. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Number three, we receive by faith. We receive by faith. God will make us take a leap of faith oftentimes when it comes to whatever he's trying to do in our lives. A leap of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 says like this. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So we remove our barriers, we ask him to come, take a step of faith. This is a, there's a, two more scriptures I think is all I got and we're done. So hang in, hang in there for me, just a minute. There's a beautiful picture of the things of God, what it means to kind of press into more of God. And of all places, Ezekiel chapter 47. And in Ezekiel chapter 47, Ezekiel is having a dream or a trance or, or something. And, and he's, God is giving him a vision. And so here, here's, here's what Ezekiel sees and here's what he writes down about that. He says, he says this, as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, cubits and then led me through the water that was ankle deep. So Ezekiel is standing on the edge of a river and this is what he sees in his vision. This is what he sees. He sees that there, there is a, uh, a man that leads and measures off a thousand cubits. I don't know exactly how far that is. And, and he measures off and, and then he guides Ezekiel to that place out from the riverbed. He guides him to that place out from the riverbed. And it's at that place that Ezekiel is now ankle deep. Then he continues. And he measured off another thousand cubic cubits and, and led him through the water that he was now knee deep. So he does the same thing again. The angel, whoever's guiding him on this journey, the man, he measures out. They go in a thousand cubits, whatever that means. They go in another thousand cubits. And now, now the difference is, is not just ankle deep, but now, now Ezekiel is knee deep. And then he measures off another thousand, and he led me through the water that was up to my waist. So he continues. And he measures off another thousand, but now it was a full-blown river that I could not cross because the water had risen and it was deep enough to swim in a river that no one could cross. Ezekiel's painting this picture about stepping into the presence of the things of God or, or a lifestyle that revolves around Jesus. And, and sure, we, we can all come in at different levels or different places and, and, and at different parts of our journey, we step into the river, maybe at salvation or whatever, and we come to a point where we're ankle deep and, and it's like, man, I, this is good. I'm so grateful for Jesus in my life. I'm so grateful. But you know what? At the end of the day, we still have our feet firmly planted on the bottom of the river. 
And, and, then, and then maybe we, we come to another point in our life or our walk with the Lord or our experience with Jesus or where we're led in to knee, knee deep. And it's like, man, look how much more of God I have in my life. And this is awesome. But at the end of the day, we're still firmly planted. And everything's still really safe at this point in the river. And, and then the angel comes back or the man comes back and he leads him into a point where he's waist high. And it's like, man, this is, this is so great. Look how much of God I have in my life and whatever. And this is awesome. But I, I still am in control. I still, everything is really safe here. But then Ezekiel describes a place in the river where our feet can no longer t touch the bottom. And we have to say, you know what, God? I trust you with my life. I trust you with everything that I have. I trust you with everything that I got. And I don't want to just be ankle deep or, or knee deep or waist deep. I want to be all in and completely immersed in who you are and what you have for me. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I want. So if you're here this morning and you would say, you know what, Nathan, every head bowed, every eye closed real quick. I've not taken that first step of baptism where I just receive the grace of God into my life, where I become a Christian or a Christ follower, where my life becomes completely immersed by Jesus and I receive his grace. If you're here this morning, you say, you know what, I would like to take that next, I would like to take that step. I would like to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. If you're here this morning, that's you. Will you just raise your hand with mine? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Yeah. This is a decision that you make in your heart. Anybody else? Yeah. Let's pray together. Let's pray this. We're going to say a prayer, but just ask the Lord to be the Lord of our life. And then, you know what? Boom. You've been baptized into the, the body of Christ. So let's all say it together. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for all that you've done for me, for the cross, everything that represents. I thank you that because of the cross, I can now be a part of the body of Christ. Jesus, I receive your forgiveness, your grace and your mercy. Come into my life, be the Lord of my life. I give myself to you completely. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, two things. Here we go. The first one is this. If that was you, if you raised your hand, uh, then, then on the central hub, there's a thing for you to fill out that just lets us know that you did that. And, and it's super important that you let us know, okay? And, and reason is because we got some gifts and some things for you. There's some, you'll get an email from me and it, it's awesome. So you don't want to miss out on that. So do that. The second thing is if, if maybe you're here today and you've never taken that second step of baptism to be water baptized. Well, you can sign up to be water baptized on our central hub, and I would love to. We'd love to do that, and and we don't have a specific time we do them, uh, water baptisms as far as time of year, but just when we know we have a couple people that are ready to do it, then then we'll do one. So, if you if you've never been water baptized or you haven't been post salvation, uh, then you need to be water baptized, and so do that. But here's the third one. The third baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is for today, and it's for all of us. It's for today, and it's for all of us. And understand that there's, God's not in any type of hurry or, or whatever, and, and understand that the, the second baptism, third baptism have nothing to do with salvation. That's a, the first baptism takes care of that, yada, yada, yada. But here's what I want to pray over us, and then we're going to pray. 
2 Corinthians chapter 13. I love this. Paul's talking about the gifts in, in, anyway, I won't get into that. I don't have time. 2 Corinthians 13 in the message. I'm gonna pray this over you. Let's, let's stand. Just put our hands out in the receiving position like the Quakers that we are. <laughs> this is, I think Paul's, anyway. The amazing grace of the master Jesus Christ. God, I, I just pray. And I thank you for each one of us that have experienced the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior, our master, Jesus Christ. The extravagant love of God. I thank you for your great love in each one of our lives. It brings life, hope, healing, restoration. And God, I pray this third one over each one of us this morning, like Paul spoke over the church in Corinth, that we would have an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit that we would have an intimate friendship with God the Holy Spirit. He wouldn't just be some mystical part of the Trinity that we don't understand or that we don't really know about, so we don't really talk about, so we don't really talk to, but that we would have an intimate friendship with God the Holy Spirit.